with that one, it's, it's such a, an intense burst, isn't it? I feel like every time I watch it, I have to sort of watch it again and then watch it a third time to sort of feel it and really kind of catch some of the moments in it. Um, but it is just like an explosion, kind of um, a race, a race through an emotion. Um, and I suppose I'd really love to just, as we've done before, pose some questions about how this collaboration came about, some of the detail in it and how it, how it kind of strikes meaningful to you as artists. So um, one of the things that I'm really curious about from, uh, from the perspective of your kind of art making is how you initially came up with the, the notion of making this kind of film. Mm, good question. Uh, so, uh, hi, it's Rick. Um, so, yeah, part of it came out of Phil, really. Um, you know, I've known Phil for quite a while now. Uh, the first time I ever saw Phil dance, he was dancing with Hoffe Schechter. Um, he was part of his company for a long time. And, uh, you know, some of Hoffe's stuff is, it can be very, very aggressive. Um, and Phil used to have, as he's starting to have again now, but he had very long dreadlocks. Um, which he then shaved off, and, and now he's growing back. Um, and uh, he started, he, it's a weird thing with contemporary dancers that I found, you know, my background is I started off with classical dancers and then, and then it kind of moved on to contemporary dancers. And what's interesting for me about contemporary dancers is they're, they're so in tune with their emotions. And the first time I ever photographed Phil, um, it's all just bubbles away there, right under the surface. And they, they seem to be able to access it far more readily because they use it far more readily um, for their performances. Um, as opposed to, you know, I think the classical sense of having a character and a role and getting into that um, and inhabiting that. I find that contemporary dancers, they do the same thing, but they draw on their own um, relevant experiences to the piece and, and, and the intention of the choreographer. So. Um, Phil is very emotive as he dances. Uh, you know, you, you, you connect emotionally. I mean, obviously with our job and, and, and Rob is the same and uh, uh, like dancers, there's an empathy. There's an exchange of emotion between them and an audience. Um, and it's the same with, you know, with what we do. And, and so generally most of us have a heightened sense of empathy. You know, when people don't like our work, they don't like us. It's very personal. <laughs> when people <laughs> like the work, it's amazing, you know. Uh, and I think I think that that energy and that empathy for that energy is 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 very there. It's very present in our lives. Um, we don't always talk about it. We don't always acknowledge it. But it's sort of a a shorthand of a secret language almost. Um, and so you know, Phil's always been very loud in my life. You know, when I've been with him. He's very emotional. He's very connected. He's 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 incredibly not like the film you've just seen. Um, he's very grounded. He's very in touch with his emotions, um, but he's also not afraid of exploring the, his emotions and not afraid not afraid of being vulnerable. And I think the key to a lot of great artists, particularly great dancers, is they're not afraid of exploring these things and, and, and going into them. So. Um, I'd witnessed a few things that Phil had shared on Instagram um, where he'd sort of unleashed a little bit um, without talking about it, without saying what it was. Um, but you could feel even through the screen, that wave of emotion. Um, and so when we were sort of, you know, myself and Rob and obviously, um, you know, with the one you and Erin uh, from One Dance and the One Dance guys about doing stuff that, um, uh, oh, Phil's going to join us in three minutes, apparently. Um, so, uh, which will be interesting because he'll deny all this. So I better, I've got three minutes to make something up. Um, <laughs> well, you set it up. Out there. Yeah, exactly. So, um, on. Uh, so, you know, uh, we wanted to do stuff that explored things that weren't talked about a little bit. Um, one of which is, is like with the last film with Jamal is actually the joy of it. The joy of transcendence of losing yourself. And with this one, I think maybe COVID had a lot to do with this but there's a lot of pent up rage um, for the unfairness of it. A lot of us also have a very, a very big sense of what's fair in life. And, and a lot of this just seemed primarily unfair. And so there's a lot of bubbling emotion um, 
that is anger. You see it with a lot of kids, funnily enough, um, uh, this frustration. Um, and so I think it was very nice to explore that because in terms of mental health and stuff that we've talked about in the past, when you say mental health, people don't go, amazing, that's good. You know, they think you're, oh, what's wrong? It's always an issue to be, you know, uh, it's not like, how's your car running? Yeah, it's going really well. It's the question is, is skewed, I think, culturally to what's wrong? Are you OK? Um, and I think with rage, uh, obviously, it's, it's seen very much as a negative um, outburst of uncontrolled emotion. And I think the reality is that, yes, that's what it is. But part of what we do, if we can harness that emotion, it's just emotion, both good and bad. If we can use it, then that's really interesting. And so the film that we wanted to sort of make, um, as with all things, it's just a starting place to talk about um, about all these issues. It's just a beginning. So, you know, we can have these conversations and it's something to hook that on. Um, what's it trying to say? Not entirely sure. I quite like, you know, Rob and I have talked about this embassy and we'll, we'll, we'll touch this again, you know, in a while. Um, it's uh, a little bit about, about um, we wanted the film to be a bit of a slap. You know, what Erin just said is when you watch it, you're like, oh, yeah, what was that? That was a little bit of a, a, mad, a mad moment. Um, I have to watch that again. And that's quite nice for us as filmmakers is that you give the audience something that you don't give it all to them. Um, or if you do, you give it all so quickly, they, they need to then digest it because I think all art is in the, is in the act of, or, or the benefit of art, is in the act of reflection on the art itself. The work is done by the audience. You know, I don't want to self, I don't want to explain something to the audience like I know what I'm talking about. Mm. And they go, yeah, yeah, I agree with that or I don't agree with that. I'd much rather ask a question and they go, yeah, that's like me or that's not like me. How do I feel? You know, and so it's about that dialogue. Mm. I don't know how Rob feels, but yeah. it's kind of... Yeah, exactly. so how is, how is this sort of initiated for you, Rob? Um, well, it's the same, very similar to, you know, the same process with Jamal in that, um, you know, Rick was wanting to do these films for a while and he he was he basically reached out and he was like this is what you know this is what, what i'm thinking i've got these three dancers and um and yeah it's it's like i didn't really again i didn't really know what to expect um and i you know i was waiting for the day of the shoot and and, and, and the footage and, and all of that and it's quite interesting because for me this is a triptych so there's three films that we've been working on together and the first film with Jamal was very much about the the, the rhythms and the sensibilities of uh, it's kind of it's kind of like it's quite it's quite form based um, and we didn't know it was going to end up there but that's where it ended up um, whereas with Phil it's all about emotion like it's all about this outpouring of um, it's it's provocative in a very different kind of way and getting to like getting to that place is quite a difficult thing to do when when you when you have I mean it's all you can look at sort of triptych of uh, films and I know there's four there ultimately be four here in this first series um, but it's um, it's kind of the idea that uh, you know this is a, it's like more of a provocation and it's not necessarily leading you anywhere um, it's it's uh, it's it's trying to uh, elicit something. And Can I jump in just so, just as a quick aside because I'd like to get Rob's take on this is that yeah. I didn't send Rob an edit. I just sent Rob all the footage and then Rob waded through it, which is quite I'd like to kind of hear from Rob emotionally how that was to wade through Phil, which and Phil can talk about this as well because he was obviously there and, and and very much it's Phil's performance. But over the course of you know a couple of hours, Phil gave various um various takes of that performance and various sensibilities and we talked about oh yeah should it be a bit more hysterical here or you know would you laugh if you were that 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 angry you know uh, that that emotion when it's that unbridled can be different things and I think we've all been there where you know you you you, you go through such a range in such a short space of time because it's unbridled um Rob just got dumped on with all this footage to look at and wade through so his emotional response, which I'm no bit part of, he then goes through that. And that's, I'd love to hear how <laughs> difficult that is, because we, sure. we don't talk about it. Sure. Well, I mean, it's one of those things when, you know, when I look at all of the footage, 
I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, this is, this, is pretty, this is pretty straightforward. Like we can actually work with this in a, in a way and kind of build something that's going to be a, a, a traditional edit. And I mean, I don't think I've ever worked on anything quite like this in terms of its complexity, to be honest, in terms of its edit com editing complexity. Uh, and it's because it's so short. I mean, the whole film's like a minute and a half. And I mean, Rick and Phil, there's, there's probably about, I don't know, it's probably about maybe 15 minutes of footage, maybe, maybe more. Hey, Phil. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's actually decoding that. And uh, yeah, it took a very long time, like, like emotionally as well, like getting into what, what was going on there, like just trying to understand it and trying to line things up because Phil was kind of unraveling through the whole, whole um, all, through all of the footage and all these different takes. Um, and there were these different points where there was like emotional highs and then different pieces, parts of the, different parts of the edit, different like points in the choreography, with, choreography where things lined up. So yeah, that was like a bit of a, like a dream, but a nightmare at the same time. So the title's pretty apt. <laughs> But, yeah, you know, got there in the end, you know, it sort of got, got but it, it, you know, it's simple ultimately in some ways, but there's a lot of complexity to it. When we were shooting it, it's the same sensibility. It's not, you start off, you're very excited. You know, we're in the studio. I've got Phil in front of me. It's going to be great. It's going to be, I'm really excited at this point. Phil and I talk about it. And then this man inhabits a, you know, a breakdown in front of you. And it's actually quite <laughs> upsetting. You know, the thing I can, uh, uh, you know, that it's akin to for me is years ago, I did a job at Universal Studios in the States and we, we had to have a set a stunt guy on fire. And I was so excited, you know, my whole kid, as a kid growing up, I'd seen films with people on fire. It looked amazing and I was so happy. And when this guy set himself on fire, I was so distressed and so upset. And I was literally crying because it was so wrong. Prime, prime in a very deep part of my mind, my, you know, my primal mind, it was wrong and upsetting. And watching Phil unravel, which I think, you know, Robbers, the phrase is perfect. Watching Phil un unravel is, is, is deeply un unsettling. Um, so, so maybe Phil needs to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's fascinating to hear the, how the alchemy has been for you and Rob, Rick. And Phil, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. So the question that we started out with, with, with was kind of how did this come about for you and what was it that sort of initiated this film for you? Oh, very loaded question. Um, first of all, sorry I'm late. Uh, I was, am I frozen already? Have no, I? No, you're My fine. internet is very unstable. So I was coming back from the beach with my son and it took longer than expected. Um, however, what, what got me started with this project? Well, Rick, Rick, he got um, in touch with me through a mutual friend in the dance world, Maya Vabalo. I don't know if you've spoken about her already. Um, and yeah, we did this shoot and it was very raw and emotional and uh, unraveling. It's a good word. And yeah, I've always had this thing about rage and anger. Um, particularly towards myself. Um, <laughs> and this is kind of the, what I was talking about with, with the dancer's sensibility, is that, is that they are in touch with these emotions. Um, and there's you know, the first time I shot Phil, which is, is what he's referring to with, with, with Maeva, is um, Maeva turned up and she had just split up with her longtime partner. And, and, and she was in pieces. And I said, Maver, you know, and obviously Phil's a dear friend of her, so he's feeling that as well. I was like, Maver, go home, you know, we're just taking pictures, no one lives or dies, it's not important. And she's like, no, it's, it's a catharsis for us. It's important that it plays out. And those pictures are, you know, incredibly moving for me to look at even now. Um, and as Phil says, the vulnerability that, that he allows us to share is, it's, it's a privilege to be around, but it's not easy. It's not easy for them and it's not easy for us. Um, but that's the joy of performance. Yeah, and, and I think 
just the fact that you held that space for me, Rick. Um, and, and I know it was actually about my ever, but it was, of course, about me as well. <laughs> Maybe that's why we're such good friends. But you, you welcomed me in my rawness, in my, you know, failures, in my whatevers. Um, and I liked it because I was a bit fat, a bit like <laughs> unhealthy, a bit weak, a bit, you know, empty somehow. And it really filled me. So, um, It's, immediately it's, yeah, to this it's project. Very special. It's, it's a very special you do like I say being there on the other end I wasn't as I think you know maybe some filmmakers I don't know would just be really excited going hey this is some good shit watch this guy unravel you know <laughs> it does not feel like a firework it, uh, it, it's deeply unsettling as, yeah. as it was for <laughs> Rob going through you know no, to totally yeah. no totally like for, for me it was and back to the dream thing, you know, like watching Phil, Phil, watching your, um, like, you know, you, you're performing in the moments and you're expressing in the moments, but I'm going back through it frame by frame and going, what is that? What is happening there? Like, how do, how can I find a way of using that? And is that emotion or that point um, saying anything? Is that important? And, and, and that's fascinating. You know, and the, I mean, I can't do that unless it's there. You know, I can't sort of analyze it in that way and actually make creative choices you know, through all of it. And you're just, you're just burning through it. You know, you're just expressing yourself. Like you're just going through all of these emotions, like the way Rick and yourself are talking about. But I'm kind of analyzing that. I'm doing a post-mortem <laughs> on, on the this, this scene, you know, this moment in time. Um, and that's... That's crazy. And I was, I was thinking about it for the longest time, like going back through it. It probably took me about, to go through all the footage, probably about three weeks in total to get like down into it, into the weeds. So, you know, what was like 15, 20 minutes ends up being, I don't know how many thousands of frames, <laughs> but it's all there. I'm, I'm you know? curious. I'm curious to know about the slow-mo footage, like the falling back <laughs> stuff that we did. <laughs> It's all, it, it, it was all there. I mean, it's just, there was so much. That, that's what's so difficult. And because there was kind of like a, there's a narrative there in that you begin in that sort of very constrained state and you end up unraveling. So there is like a narrative. So you have to work into that, even though it's a very loose narrative. Um, so, you know, that was purely through the edit itself, like trying to like, go, okay, cool. You're, you're sitting wearing a suit, you're, you're, you're constrained staring straight at the camera, you know, and it's, it's finding those moments when that, when that sort of, that begins, like when, you know, you start to let go, um, but that all has to line up. So there's some sort of flow and yeah, it's, it's literally, there's so much more footage. I could make probably another, I don't know, 20 of these, you know, it's, 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 it's insane. <laughs> it's very and, hard to choose uh, and uh, yeah you know, but both for an edit but also rob created the rooms behind you know this space and you know we always you know rob and i have a great shorthand of references of everything we've ever seen um and and for whatever reason we have a shared um uh sort of outlook on a lot of things uh, particularly the stuff that we like and we don't like um uh, which is very helpful obviously um, but those rooms reflect that emotion as well. So the, the stuff before the break, um, it's very straight. It's very direct. Those rooms are very solid and very real. And even though we have these camera moves, which are done mostly in post as well, you know, um, as that break happens and in tune with the music as well, suddenly the rooms start to move because everything falls apart. And so I think it's that trying to reflect, having witnessed Phil's performance, that if this was in a real space, how would that feel to be on the inside? And the sands sh shift and everything becomes liquid, walls close in. There is suddenly a, you know, and we try to reflect that in the way that the camera moves, the way that the background feels, is that there is that oppression and as that emotion comes out, there is that falling and there is that falling away. And it's, it's a very, you know, it's a visual language for, that hopefully reflects Phil's emotional state, but also, uh, you know, as Rob says, it has to have that arc of a, it's not exactly a narrative, but that arc of emotion that you feel on this little journey 
So it begins, mm -hmm. it middles and it ends. Um, yeah. And we actually well, revisited some of the music as well with the sound designer Gavin at Echo Lab because the music originally just ends and it's ends. And we wanted this echo to be at the end so that because you don't walk away from these emotions. You know, if you're in a mad rage and you punch the wall, it doesn't end, it dissipates slowly. That, that energy is, is, is a thing of entropy where it dissolves into nothing. And so that music, we wanted to tie in with that shot of Phil where the color disappears at the end and he steps away from that emotion. And it's all these different little elements, which, you know, we're not making a, we're not making a movie, you know, it's not, there's not a, a complex, you know, uh, there's not much to play with, you know, as Rob said, it's a minute, you really don't have much time, but it all has to be in there. So, um, so you, you mentioned there about the red, and that really struck me in watching this was the very limited color palette. So why did you make that decision? What was that decision about? Uh, I, I can start with that for, for two reasons. Um, one, Rob and I both love red, white, and black, just as a palette. It works very well. It's very stylistic and it's very strong. Um, but for me, my wife's a little crazy. You know, she's a Torian. She's pretty forceful. Uh, and she can lose her mind, you know, uh, at moments. Not so much nowadays, but back in our early days, you know, something would happen and she'd kick off. And she would describe it in terms of the red mist coming down. And, and, and it's, it's a very big cultural and visual metaphor for the red. Even James Bond, you know, the, in the opening credits of that, it comes down red. And it's not just blood. It's the blood that comes up in your face, that welling up of emotion. And suddenly everything tunnels down. Um, and so obviously it's a, it's, a, it's a very good natural metaphor in our language, in our cultural and visual language that says rage. And for us, we wanted that trans transcendent moment again, where it goes from normality to slightly another world. And, and the other world has to be one of rage. And so that's where, for me, that's where the red came in. But Rob and I, we, we, we back and forth about this a lot. And quite yeah, we tried stuff. Look. Yeah. We tried quite a bit of stuff. We tried lots of palettes and we had a, you know, and it's, it, you know, it basically goes back to that performance and, you know, it's a primordial thing. I mean, this is a very primordial, you know, Phil's giving it up and it feels like, like it's freaking, you know, it's, it's genetic. Like what you're seeing here is very like, it's the origins of things. That's what it feels like. You know, an emotion is that, you know, like, like letting go. And red is, you know, it's about as, uh, and also in terms of the color range, like the color science, I'm not a color, color scientist, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's tonally very, very close to um, to black. You know, the the, gom, the, the gamut of red is, is like if if you're looking at a traffic light from a distance, you're going to see that red light first, even if the other two, the green and the yellow, are. So it's 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 something that that's that's it's in us. It's innate um, and it's a part of our nature. So yeah, yeah it feels like that. You There's know, a few filmmakers, the you know, like don't look now. There's red. Ken Loach never has anything red in any of his films because your eye always goes to it. Um, you know, Schindler's List, you know, there's the red balloon. There's a lot of films that that either play with that or avoid it for exactly that thing. And there is something deeply emotive about the colour. Yeah. And you mentioned the sort of physiological, the blood rising to your face. And Robbie, we're talking about the way that we see things. So, Phil, I, I wonder from a physiological perspective, your output physically expressing this and doing that 15 minutes of of the raw footage as well as the emotional output how did that feel for you what was that like i don't know I don't know i just um Lots of different things. A bit of uh, shyness because sometimes I can be quite shy, so I don't really know what to do. So I just want to impress. So I do some cool shit, um, <laughs> uh, or I flex my muscles or something like that. But it was also kind of like satisfying to be this performer who gets watched to you know feed the ego a little bit. But at the same time, I like I said before, I did have anger, uh, rage issues, which I'm dealing with. Um, 
uh, yeah, so I, it felt like a very freeing release type thing. And physically, physically, it's really nice to engage the body till you're sweating. And like sometimes it's just really, really important, uh, whether yeah. it's a work, workout, dancing or martial arts, or whatever it is that someone enjoys, there's something very spiritually uh, connecting when you just let go and like get fierce. Yeah, I think I, I recently I'm learning that anger is actually something to be harnessed, and um, I'm curious about that. I'm yeah. Curious about that. I remember a lot in my movement practice feeling a catharsis in, and you talked about catharsis, Rick, with with Mava, but that feeling of just going right to the edge and really letting your body just feel what it feels. But I think sometimes rage is this. Um, sort of this emotion that isn't allowed and the expression of rage particularly can be something that that feels um harnessed is is the thing that i i really like that as a conceptualization of of expressing and feeling anger but sometimes we feel like we're not allowed to have that emotion so i don't know i wonder if you have any thoughts about your movement practice and about expression of of anger or rage if that's helpful or if it's something that you you can use or do you um it's, hmm. could you ask that question again please <laughs> <laughs> i'm terrible at asking questions i just go off on a tangent um no i guess the question really at its core is what does movement how does movement for you act as a maybe a release or um a catharsis Yeah, good, great question. Um, thank you for asking that question again. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if I feel upset, for example, today, normally I do exercise in the morning or, you know, I'll push my body somehow, but not like till it's painful. You know, I, I work very much within a range of flow. I call it my flow state. Like if 10 is maximum effort, and one is sitting on a couch. I want to be at seven where I'm sweating, but I'm like, it's still fun. It's that joy place. And I find that there are some days where I want to push it to like an eight. And those are the days when the sea, for me, I get in the sea, sorry. For me, I get in the sea every day. Um, and, and those are the days when the waves come, when the south winds are blowing and, and I like to, you know like hit the waves and be with them um and today for example it's super mellow there's no um waves at all it's like a lake and i went in today i like held my breath for you know just 30 seconds at a time the water is seven degrees it's cold it's really cold like basically naked and that and that to me is a movement practice because i have to hold my breath i have to become one with the water just like, you know, Bruce Lee said, we talked about Bruce Lee a bit, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, those are my thoughts to that question. I don't know if that answers it, but. Yeah, yeah. Like no, I, I think the movement, the movement practice that you've described and sort of putting it on that one to 10 scale and describing seven as joy. I mean, that's, that's really fascinating because I think about my own movement practice and sort of from a kind of, a challenge perspective maybe five was joy for me because once I got to seven I was I was suffering a bit <laughs> but I think but getting into the sea and cold water and breath practice you know those are experiences that we have in our bodies that we you know like emotion it's physiological and it's psychological and we are experiencing it all the time living in and inhabiting that body and that emotion so it's really fascinating I, to hear that I, can I add one more thing? Yeah. Um, that breath, I've really, because I've been fascinated with the breath for ages, I've started to notice my breath when I'm watching film or um, when I'm watching content. Um, and I started to feel, and what you guys do, uh, Rob and Rick, is create these pockets. Like I've noticed me breathing in the pattern of the emotion being shown by an actor or by editing or you know lights or whatever it is the shot and uh, when I tap into that 
I feel like, yeah, this is, just, again, it's another opportunity to connect somehow. So breath is something that ties it all together, movement or yeah, all of it, all of it. Yeah. Just a, a question for Rob and Rick. Do you, do you notice your breathing when you're working? Is it something that you've ever attended to? Because I'd be really curious. You guys are doing heavy emotional work, particularly, Rob, when you were talking about the editing process for this. It's, yeah, it's emotional so, work. It's really interesting that Phil's talking about the ocean because, like, I grew up in South Africa um, and I surfed from when I was, like, a really young kid. So I, I probably started surfing when I was about, I don't know, 13, something. Um, obviously, I live in Canada now and I'm a long way away from the ocean. We've got the Great Lakes here. But that's what I miss about living near the ocean. And I think there's something when, you, when you're in, not, not the sea, the ocean, you're connected to something a lot bigger than you and it's temperamental and it's like emotion. Um, and, you know, one day you can get into the sea, into the ocean, sorry, and like it can be wild and, and tempestuous and dangerous and like gnarly, you know. Um, and, th and that's just what it's doing, you know. And emotionally, it's quite interesting because when you surf or when you spend time in the ocean, you learn a lot about how you feel and how you think because you realize that these are all fleeting things, just like the weather and just like... But with being in water, it's... it's um, you, you become a part of something much bigger than you. You can't get out of it. You're in it. You've got to go with it. You've got to let go. You know? And when you're in the swell and you're in the surf, you, you, you've got to let go. You know? If it's eight foot and dumping in your head, you've just got to let go. You can't fight it. And I think all of that's really interesting. Like, and I'm glad Phil talks about that. And I'm glad that's part of his practice. I mean, it's just so amazing hearing that. And I've got a lot of friends that do that. They live by that. They live by going into the water every day. It's a religion for them. It's a way of life. Um, and it connects you emotionally to, it helps you. It's a meditation for sure. Very powerful. I miss that. I don't have it here. Great Lakes. <laughs> Good luck if you get in there. <laughs> <laughs> it should be a nice cube. <laughs> yeah, you won't what's, come out. <laughs> what's the temperature of the water there? Um, well, guys surf here in the water and they go swimming. Like I ran down in the middle of summer um, after the first couple of years of living here in yeah, Lake Ontario. I ran down in the middle of summer and jumped into the water and people were sitting on the beach staring at me like I was some sort of anomaly. And I ran out of the lake so quickly um, it changed me as a person <laughs> and that's in the middle of summer that's in the do middle you, of summer do you have any idea of the degrees of the water though it's no it's it, it's seriously it must be about i don't know like 10 degrees like mass like maybe 15 like the warmest it gets maybe 15 17 and that's celsius yeah yeah it's that's warm pretty, for me it's cold here because i'm used yeah. to like you know. But that's it, isn't it? It's about the shock of something. It is. You go um, into it with the breath, you, you, you get to experience all the stuff, the juicy stuff you were just talking about, you know, the, the, the emotional understanding. The, you learn a lot about yourself. And, but that's control, yeah. isn't it? I mean, that's also controlling your, your body. Control over your reaction to something uncontrollable, like the right. ocean. But you yeah. can control the way that you connect with it or not, like... And that's what I love about it. And that's what I love about the catharsis system. It's going back to your question of, of movement and what you guys do, creating these visual sweeties, treats. Yeah, it's all lovely. Breath. Well, that's that, what, you know, what feels just there. And I, I may have to get a tattoo that says that, but it's, it's control, you know, control, control of yourself in the face of something uncontrollable. And as Rob touches on the sea, is it's it's about surrender to it because it's it's you it's obviously more powerful than you so sure. you can't fight you can't go with it but the flip side of that is, is is you know it's completely what phil just said is that the only thing you can control is your reaction to it and i think you know that's that's i think what we're trying to start this conversation about rage because rage is you know by its very definition is in control uncontrollable you know, it's it's completely unbridled. It's completely overpowering. Um, but there are moments, and that that you find um, that that you become aware in the middle of it. And that's usually, you know, as Phil says, that's usually 
take a deep breath. It's in the language that we use. Take a breath, <laughs> you know, and when we're filming a lot of this stuff, um, you know, it, it's weird how breathing is meant to be, you know, completely automatic. You know, the thing I find more than anything else filming dancers is that I'm holding my breath <laughs> for long periods and suddenly it'll be like, <clears throat> like I'll come up from the, under, under the water. And I don't notice that my body's actually shut down one of its sort of autonomous functions because I'm so focused and, and engrossed in their performance and caught up in their emotions. And that's the thing of, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, what we do when we film dancers is allow them this protective bubble. That's my biggest hope is that, as Phil says, we allow them this bubble where they, they can be safely vulnerable. They can let loose and let rip if they want to, if that's something they want to do. And, it, it, you know, it doesn't leave the bubble. It's going to be OK. There's enough trust there between us that I'm not going to exploit it or say, hey, look, I've got this great photograph of Phil losing his mind. That's not I would never do that or betray that trust. And I've, so I've released have loads of those on social media anyway, so it's fine. Like, there's plenty of them out there. <laughs> I, can show the the, the, I can show the tattoo at last, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Fantastic, yeah. It, it is fascinating. And so going back to your earlier question about, you know, or, or, or one of our themes is how is this useful and mm. how can it be useful? Um, and I think rage is an emotion um, or the acknowledgement of some of these feelings. Um, that in itself is useful, but going back to, you know, what Phil just said, it's the only thing we can do in the face of uncontrollable emotion when we're feeling at our absolute worst. The only thing we can do is to control how, our, how we react to that and to stand outside of it and to stand back from it and that it's not our, that's not who we are, that's just what's going on. Um, yeah. And controlling that reaction, I think, is, you know, is, is what it's about um but my mother but you made me you just made me remember a story that my mother used to tell me so when I was an emotional teenager she would she used to tell me in my motion in my like high emotion moments like well you know the only thing you can control is how you react to that and it used to just drive me around the bend absolutely drive me around the bend and now there's there's so much wisdom in it and I recognize how important it is to just it, to be surrendering to those emotions and also to just accept that they're there the notion that they're going to arise and they're going to pass and they're going to arise again and they're going to pass these emotions are are a part of our experience and if we're kind of constantly spending all of our time denying them or fixing them or changing them but it's also how are they useful to the performer you know, I mean, it's great for me because I can say to Phil, hey, Phil, this is what I'm thinking this part needs. And Phil can deliver on that. And then we can make a film and then we can have this conversation and we can show it to people. But there's a reality of Phil's experience, which is he can tap into those emotions and use them for good, you know, use them as part of his performance. And I think to dismiss rage as, oh, that's something I go through over there and I want nothing to do with it. I want to be as far away from it as possible that actually doesn't acknowledge them. And it also doesn't say, well, hang on, maybe there's something important that we need to look into there. And maybe there's a, a piece of work that that can actually be really useful because then, you know, it is the commonality that we have of the shared human experience. We like performances because they speak to a part of us. And that doesn't always have to be the joy happy bit. You know, there's a, a great deal of that we've just gone through in the last year, year and a half. Um, collectively, independently, um, and it's sometimes it's acknowledging these emotions that we've been through that um, that I think is important to say, yeah, you're not alone, even though you're alone. <laughs> but I'm going through what you're going through. Um, I'm alone too, uh, and that's I think that's important um, right another, now. Another maybe really good question to ask all of you, um, you know, except for the filming, which of course, Rob, you were not there for you've all worked alone and Phil, you've worked alone to develop your craft and that's what's what's kind of on, on show here. You've all worked your whole lives to develop your craft and then you've all created this film together but separate from one another. So how does it feel to be working alone in the context of, of this year? 
Ooh, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it, it's very weird because as as a director and a photographer, you know, the page or the screen is, is nowhere near as big as the experience. You know, the experience is always bigger and more powerful. Um, and you know, my job obviously is, is is I give Rob that footage, but at the same time, Rob and I have all those conversations where I'm trying to express the experience so that he then can get into the mindset of what Phil's been through, what Phil's trying to say, what I'm trying to say, and have his own take on it. It's a very collaborative process. There's no point in me saying to Rob, Rob, I see this, you know, do, basically doing the edit completely myself and saying, Rob, just make this look pretty. You know, I, I could, I, I'm sure there's a guy somewhere on the end of a phone I can do that to. Rob is not that guy because Rob has so much more to bring to it. Um, in the same way that I wouldn't say to Phil, Phil, this is precisely what I want you to do. And don't put your foot there, put it here. And that's, that's not my job. You know, my job is, is really as a director is, 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 is to wrangle these collaborators so that they all have enough space that hopefully I'm giving Rob what I try and give Phil, which is a space to create. Um, even though I'm nudging them in directions, you know, Rob equally nudges me back and go, yeah, but look at this. <laughs> I know you were thinking this, but look what's here. Um, if this language is reinterpreted, because Rob is an interpreter of what he finds. And like he says, he could make 20 different films out of what I gave him, you know, 20 different cuts that would all be fantastic, but they would say something different. And so between us, and, and we don't always have the conversation. It's really just a feel, you know, Rob will, you know, on the end of a phone, Rob will know that I lean one way or not the other, you know, because he, again, like Phil, like myself, has a, a, an overactive sense of empathy. So he can feel what I'm thinking when I'm talking to him, even if I'm saying something different um, and he can read me. So that's part of the this sort of triangle of which that's also going on with Olivia, who I'm, you know, work with for clothing, at, but she has a much bigger role. Also, you know, the guys that assist me, they are reading my mind constantly. And we have this, as with other dancers, they, we have this, this energy that goes between us. And, and it's fascinating to step back from occasionally because normally you're in it and you're so in it, you don't notice it. But when we have things like this and you ask these crazy questions that you ask, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we do do that. Yeah, that is weird. I don't know, can't explain it. <laughs> I don't know what Rob's take on it is. Well, yeah, I mean, it's exactly what you're saying. It's, it is that sort of, um, you know, being a mind reader, basically. And like the, the more the more layers there are there, the, the, the actually the more uh, the more fun it is, like the more challenging it is, you know. So you're not really isolated as such. Like I've never seen it like that. Those collaborations are very important. You know, the creative collaborations that you have in your life as an artist or creative person in any pursuits. I like lifeblood, it's like oxygen. So if you don't have those, you actually just become some minion, like sitting behind a desk, you know, doing Zoom calls all day, which is not what this is, but it's very different. <laughs> and I, I, I honestly believe that, you know, there's a, there's a fight in there, there's, there's a creative fight, which, you know, in some ways, like it comes at any cost. Like literally I've seen that, you know, you, I, I mean, there, there were times when I sort of have worked in isolation before and I'm like, well, this is it. You know, this is really frustrating. Um, but then sometimes you lean into it and you go, well, this is actually what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it. It's really important. And then, and then you start seeing some light and then you start, you know, you start drawing on your strengths, you know. And then all of a sudden, you know, Phil's in front of you. Like, and there's 20 minutes of Phil, like putting it on the line, you know, and that's a gift. And that's what it is. That's where it comes from. So you I couldn't do that, like, in any other context. So... Uh, and Rick knows how to, you know, he, he knows exactly that. Like, he, he's this conduit in a way, but at the same time, you know, he's directing it. He's he's channeling it as much as he's sort of like, you know, putting the pieces together. And he's going, what do you think of this? Like, what do you think of these, these suggestions? Like, this could work. Um, and that, that's really what it comes down to. I, I've worked with so many different types of people. And I, a lot of it really also comes down to kind of an optimism about these things, even though these subjects are very, very difficult to tackle. You know, I mean, this is a very tough subject. The subject matter is quite grisly. <laughs> um, and, you know, you've, this isn't sort of sitting in some 
dingy post-production facility that, you know, you just can't, you can't work like that. It's never been like that. You know, you're kind of in a space where you're solving problems and um, you're looking at what ifs, not, you know, why nots, um, you know, and that's how I see it. You know, it's, it's about possibilities and creating opportunities. And that's what I love about making me, that's why I absolutely love making these films with Rick is it's actually putting the dancers on a pedestal as well, which is just amazing, you know, like working with incredibly talented dancers and putting them on a pedestal is just such a gift. So, you know, I couldn't have stumbled, you know, I've worked with a few choreographers in my life and it's always just amazing. It's this incredible like experience and you can't choose it. Like I can't go out there and pick it and go, I want to work with that dancer. That's who I want to work with. I'm just not like that. Um, but when it comes across to the desk and it's like, it's, it's, it's almost like meant to be. So yeah, it breaks that isolation and it creates that connection and it's a creative connection. It's almost you know, sort of without boundary. So it's kind of a way of living my life. Of course we can pick it. Of course we can choose it. <laughs> do this again. Let's just do it again. We'll find new artists. There's always opportunities. And I think that's the key word, Rob. Um, yeah, looking for opportunities. Actually, work, having worked alone, I've been much more able to dive deeper because I'm bored. <laughs> so I'm like, where, where's the challenge? Where's the challenge? You know, I'm not having to deal with that many people. I mean, now it's a bit different, but it's like, it's, I can't blame anything. I can't blame anything for any of my problems. So um, I can make whatever I want. And, you know, I don't know where the limits of that is because we want, on one level we want to believe, oh, it's limitless. But on another level, I can almost feel people going, yeah, but there's a limit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But yeah, there's only so much that's possible. And I don't know if I believe that because otherwise there is no limitless. Do you know what I mean? Very complicated, but we create our opportunities. I know it. We have to. And... I'm just reminded of, of how life began. It's like one sperm, not many. It's like one gets through of the 500 million or something. And so after that, the man grows and then there's however many in his eggs, sacks, whatever. <laughs> but my point is that we have to go back to the one, like it's not anyone else. It's, I think it's a really important thing that we've been pushed into these kind of just for a season, because we have to find our way, you know, out to express. And I think that's why it's really, really important for us to feel all of these emotions and find ways that feed the growth and the benefit of yourself and others. And we have to feel this stuff and we can't feel it unless we are alone because we have to face ourselves when we're alone because we get bored. Uh, or if you're not willing to go and like face yourself in a healthy growth way if you're not growing you're dying um and that's why it's so key to have these kinds of conversations <laughs> yeah or you can you can feel it's close to my heart um so yeah yeah and it's so clear just listening to all of you talk about the collaborative experiences that you have and about your art how incredibly powerful it is in your lives. And I, I really get the sense of how, how these collaborations, like, like you said, Rob, are a lifeblood, but um, that they're also feeding something deeply powerful and important in you. Um, your, your artistic voice, your artistic expression, your growth as a human being. And um, I think um, maybe just just as a place to kind of bring this to a close, um, I suppose I'd like to hear from, from you about kind of maybe what the, what the future might look like for you, you guys as an artist. So we're all looking at the future right now and wondering a little bit what it's gonna look like after this, this past year. Um, maybe thinking into the future, what, what have you taken away from uh, from this past year as an artist, and and what do you think you're going to take into the future with you? I think we touched on this, you know, one of our earlier talks, is that 
it's really important in life to have really good obstacles. Otherwise, you know, as Phil says, we have nothing. We have, we, you know, we, we just have ourselves. Um, and good obstacles, you know, create good solutions because creativity will out. So, you know, yeah, COVID's been really tough. Um, but if you search for the things that come out of it, these relationships that we have, that have been put on hold or have been difficult to uh, consummate, you know, in many ways, um, and to get really involved in, in, in a very physical, you know, in a physical universe, um, that we value those going forward even more so, that we don't forget come, you know, the summer, we forget, oh yeah, it's all, yeah, yeah, it wasn't last year, you know, awful. And you forget that actually, it's only about these connections for us, as, as, as you know, as humans, to connect is such a primal thing. For people as damaged as creatives as all of us are, you know, that connection is everything. Um, you know, as Rob said, it's the lifeblood. Those, um, those things are so important. But the, but the flip side of that is that, you know, we made these films during this stuff. You know, everything you've, you've, we've done, we've made during this stuff and we've continued to make stuff. Um, Rob, who is my, you know, my absolute partner in crime uh, in this, COVID aside, lives 8,000 miles away, deliberately, I might add, but, you know, and, that, and he might have his own reasons for that, but we still do this work together. Um, and there's no reason we couldn't have done a version of this exactly like this. Creativity will out. We will find a solution because that's our job is to find solutions. So I, I'm not, if anything, I'm heartened by all the wonderful work that's been made during this time because this is who we are. We, we, we you know, we, we want to make work and we will find a way and bigger, bigger problems create better solutions. You know, that's, that's my take. Mic drop. <laughs> 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 this is why they don't give me the mic very often. <laughs> yeah. And Ram, do you have any thoughts or feelings on that? Anything to add? No, I think it's pretty spot on. Back Rick summed it up really well. I mean, it is, you know, it is, um, <clears throat> yeah, back to the lifeblood sort of thing and like looking, looking to the future. I think, um, I think this time has informed us all that came out of nowhere. It reminds me a lot of the film we've just made with Phil. It's like, there's a shot where sort of Phil slaps himself, and he, he splits, and it feels like that. I mean, this thing came out of nowhere, and um, I, it was almost exactly a year ago. Um, and I, I kind of think that um, ultimately, I, I think well, things will go back to normal. You know, we'll go back to our, our normal routines, we're creatures of habits. Um, hopefully you'll remember this time and remember how important people are and how important those relationships are, people that actually you really do love and care about. Um, and, and, I, and, and that really is kind of what I hope for. Like, I, I feel we, we, we're at a, we live in a time where we've been so disconnected in so many ways because of the technology that we work with and because of the way we interact with each other. Um, and hopefully people have rem remembered a little bit about what's important in their lives. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's what I hope you know and the hope the future brings just, just sort of a little bit more a little less quantity and a little bit more quality in life but you know the world's a crazy place right now so we'll see but that's my hope so it's a, the idealist in me or, um, or are you crazy <laughs> yeah well totally <laughs> dude without a doubt <laughs> <laughs> right <after. laughs> uh, yeah um, me too me too <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah yeah so how about you what, what do you think you'll be taking F away future yeah i mean what i took away from before it began like we have to we have to work on ourselves always so that means the future is bright if you choose it to be and you just work and you work and you work and you enjoy and you go to that seven out of ten on everything that you do but it's not seven out of ten excellence it's seven out of ten like pushing versus pulling you know and for me a vision has to be something that you're not always pushing for it's so exciting that it pulls you you know through hard times through kind of like tension um, 
more oppressive feeling times like now. So, I mean, I, I don't have any concerns at all about whatever happens, you know, I have to manage my emotions no matter what. So, and emotions, emotions are energy in motion. So if we, if we start manifesting as many as healthy relationships between our emotions as we can, it's like that film, what's it called? Uh, that Pixar film, did anyone see oh, it about the yeah. emotions? Oh, Oh, no, no. Um, yeah. Can't remember the name of it. Yeah. And they had like anger. Inside, inside out. out. Yeah. Inside That's out. the one. That's the one. Inside out. Um, so it's a bit like that. But when we manage them and we become a bit more harmonious with them all and let them have their ebb and flow, then we create a more kind of like healthy one now, like a good seed. Getting back to the seeds, the plant, the tree. We take that into the future. Um, and surely that has to benefit lots of lots of other lives so i have got no doubts about how wonderful the future is do you think does anyone doubt at this point that that phil would just raise his arm up and a seagull would land on it <laughs> <laughs> i think he's more like a hawk yeah yeah maybe a hawk yeah called mordecai yeah yeah, needs, yeah. yeah. swings by <laughs> <laughs> oh, good oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that's the next oh. film right there. Yeah. <laughs> this is this has been such a wonderful conversation, and they always are. And I'm really grateful for your time, and I'm really grateful as ever for your insights and your just immense knowledge. So thank Grace. you again. Yeah, um, thanks for curating. Yeah, it's lovely to see wonderful. you. Wonderful. Wonderful to see you all. Yeah, no, we guys, yeah, you, too. You, you guys gave us a safe space to do this in, and, and and the encouragement, you know, which is 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 tough sometimes, especially in a world that is, you know, a little straight laced at times and scared of seeing anything, you know, a little out there. You guys gave us a, a little safe haven, so it's it's yeah, it's amazing. Amazing appreciated. Amazing. It's a pleasure, real pleasure. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. You, I hope you do do well the rest of the weekend here, and we'll see you soon. Cool. Thanks. Cheers, Danny. Bye, guys.